100 years ago, the people of Scotland launched a financial revolution that came this close to succeeding. That dream died on this spot in one moment of madness. That bullet triggered the First World War, but it also shattered the dreams of the people of Great Britain who had worked for 10 years to create a financial revolution, a peaceful transformation of the way they fund public services. A Balkan dissident, Gavrilo Princip, assassinated the heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Today the murder scene attracts tourists fascinated by the slaying of the Archduke and his wife. But to reveal the untold story of one of the consequences of that terrible deed, we need to travel to Glasgow. Why did the people of Scotland decide to break with the past and take control of their destiny? Inspiration for the financial revolution came with the visit to Glasgow of Henry George, an American journalist. The atmosphere in this hall was electrifying that night. This was Henry George who'd come across the Atlantic to speak to them. Some of them would have known what he was going to say. They might have read his book, Progress and Poverty. But actually to hear it from the man himself in their own hall was truly thrilling. A few days before, he'd been over to the Isle of Skye where the first of the troubles started and he got a very good reception there and of course when he strutted out onto this stage here in Glasgow he was also very warmly received but he started off and he said you know I've been accused in the past of flattering Scotsmen I'm not going to do that this time and he didn't mince his words he said what I've seen in Glasgow has horrified me grinding poverty alongside fabulous wealth he said, this is a Christian country, isn't it? But this doesn't look like Christianity to me. You're putting up church after church. Well, what about your people? He said, he joked with them. He said, maybe you're confusing the Lord with the laird. Maybe you think the laird made the heaven and earth. And he gave an example over in Dundee where he'd been, uh, where the, the local people were drawing the water supply from a loch owned by an earl. And they were having to pay 25,000 pounds for the privilege. He said, look at this. This guy is charging you for the very rain that falls from the sky. And he said, you know, overseas, as fighters, you are fearsome warriors. You're like lions in battle, but you seem to be sheep over here. And then he went on to propose his remedy, the taxation of land values. And of course, the idea of suddenly the responsibility for paying the, run, the country's running costs was to fall on those who actually claimed to own the country, while those who actually did the work and generated the wealth had their taxes lifted. This was revolutionary. A week later, he was back in here again, speaking with other speakers, and uh, apparently they had to turn away hundreds of people. The hall was absolutely packed, and the Scottish Land Restoration League was formed. Well, there was tremendous progress then. Obviously, campaigning groups saw that um, this was a real focus, land value taxation, a real focus for land reform. Quickly, the Liberals took it up, initially in Scotland, and they saw the urban potential of it as well as the rural. They saw what a social and economic change this would um, enable. Well, Westminster politics got in the way um, a Tory government was installed in 1895 and they stayed in place 
until 1905. So although there were bills introduced, they didn't actually make any progress. But in the meantime, Glasgow Corporation and a few other local authorities had seen the sense of actually levying their rates from site values rather than penalising much needed housing by including buildings in the assessment. So in 1905, Glasgow promoted a bill to enable them to do that. Well, it made good progress, but it ran out of parliamentary time. The next year, the Liberals won a landslide victory. Glasgow again was at the forefront. It led a petition of 518 local authorities to urge Parliament to introduce this measure. So at the end of 1906, the government introduced the Land Values Scotland Bill. It easily went through the Commons. It was defeated in the Lords. They introduced it again. Again, the Lords blocked it. The fight was taken to the landlords in Parliament by this man, a Welshman, David Lloyd George. He was the Chancellor of the Exchequer who worked in that building, the Treasury. And he was aided and abetted by a young soldier turned politician, Winston Churchill. No Chancellor of the Exchequer in modern times has ever had to raise so much money for the necessities of the country. The objects for which this new taxation is imposed are not challenged by any party in the land. The budget therefore inflicts no gratuitous burden on the community. We want more money in order to strengthen the Navy, so to keep our shores safe from any possible invader. To provide pensions that will give comfort to a million men and women in their declining years, and to carry out many a long desired and long promised plan of social reform to redeem the people from anxieties and suffering which are now so grievously oppressing them. It will at last compel the great landlords to contribute to the community a fair share of that increased value of their land which the community and not their own exertions Created. So that was the famous People's Budget of 1909 and there was the provision for valuation of course. So this was too much for the Lords. The aristocratic landed element saw what was coming. They panicked, they defeated it, there was absolute uproar. The Lords were accused of acting unconstitutionally uh, acting in self-interest rather than the nation's interest. There was a constitutional crisis. Parliament was dissolved. Two general elections were held in 1910. There was even a threat that the King might have to intervene and create enough Liberal peers to swamp the House. But in the end that didn't happen and the Lords accepted that they were going to be reformed. And that is what happened. And in fact, one of the reforms was that the Lords were stripped of all future powers to interfere in finance bills. Despite the safety nets of the welfare state, many people in Scotland continue to suffer deprivation. Their losses can be traced back to the kinds of taxes levied by the government in Westminster. Skyscrapers stand as monuments to the failure of past policies. The attempt to give people a new start failed to erase poverty and unemployment. The towers are now being abandoned and blown up. But what would have happened if that financial reform had been implemented? According to a professor of economics in Scotland, everybody in Britain today would have been much richer. And that's because the annual rate of growth of the economy would have been 2% higher per annum for the past 100 years. Had the growth rate been 4.5% instead of 2.5%, a reasonable expectation with a, a benefit, ben, beneficent stimulative fiscal system rather than its opposite, we could have had a growth rate of 4.5% 
attaching to this ten and a half thousand pounds per year per head, yielding a sixfold increase in per capita income to fifty nine thousand instead of ten thousand and instead of twenty two thousand, which we did achieve. This would be the figure that we might expect to achieve because of the power or the magic of compound interest at just a two percent additional growth rate on top of the one that we prevailed before would have yielded a tripling an almost tripling of incomes in 20, 2012 compared to what we actually had so the difference between this and this the 22,000 and the 59,000 is in the order of 36 or 37,000 pounds per head this, this is what we've lost this is the, a measure of the damage that the deadweight loss bad tax system yields this is what we have lost and what we could still gain today going forward. The people of Scotland are now demanding greater control over their lives under nationalist leader Nicola Sturgeon. According to Professor Rich Mitchell of Glasgow University, Scotland abolished feudalism just a decade back, so the culture of cap-doffing is still common across much of rural Scotland. Disconnection with the land is equally common in cities. The bullet fired in Sarajevo triggered a world war. Trench warfare across Europe cost the lives of many brave men. But that war also ended the dream of financial justice in Britain. In 2014, the world commemorated World War I. But there has been no commemoration of the spirit of the people of Britain who fought hard between 1905 and that resolution in Glasgow and 1914 when the values, the land values were coming on stream and were due to be collected to fund the public good.